This little unit is delightfully trashy, but also actually quite clever at the same time. It can run up to 130 LEDs. This is the 1 to 30 LED option, uh, but I've got 15, I think, LEDs connected. But watch what happens when I turn it on. You turn it on, they start off red, and then they gradually fade to magenta and then blue, and then they'll fade back to red again. You'll see a bit of shimmer because it is using phase angle control and also uh, alternating the phase to actually light the different colours. But watch what happens if I turn it off and on again. So, off and on, it stays on at red, off and on, stays on at magenta, off and on, stays on at blue. Slow cycle between, between the colours, off and on. Faster cycle between the colours, off and on, even faster, and then super disco mode between the colours, and then back to the original one. So there's effectively about eight settings in this. Now, these things were used in rather... They'd appeal to old ladies, that's all I'll say, huge bouquets of flowers that were made of basically spiralled aluminium wire. And these were just pushed through them. And keep in mind that there are exposed connectors on these. So if the wire basically went into the little connector, or if the LED popped out a little bit and the wire went in, it could potentially have made the whole thing live. And I remember looking at one thinking, are they really in series? Because the first ones were just uh, cold white or warm white LEDs. And I looked closer and it was just two core flex going to it. And I was looking, thinking these must be 24 volt. And though I was following the wire down through it. No, they were all in series. And anyway, that's nice because it means that if an LED fails, you can just basically pull it out and you can get a replacement and put it in, particularly in the single color versions. A bit more odd on the this one. Here's one of the LEDs out of it. I turn it on and it lights blue. I turn it round and it lights red because it is just literally two inverse parallel LEDs. So I see that the same effect is now using uh, low voltage now. They maybe had some instance, but let's open it up and take a look at the circuitry inside. I shall put my little Chinese test unit out the way. It does make me think that because you can't really tell which way around the LEDs are, I think there there is an actual anvil in there, but quite hard to see. But I'm guessing, as I did with this one, that they just put the LEDs in random order. And then I turned the power on and then turned the power off to turn them the other ones around. But I'm guessing you've seen the factories in China. It was probably a little old lady with cotton gloves on, just pulling the LEDs out live and stuffed them in round the other way around. That's how it works there. Anyway, here is the spudja. I've already, I'll show you the inside, but I've already taken the picture, so we can go straight to that without any delay. Inside is this rather complex looking little circuit board, and well, this is where I can cut straight to the chase, and oh, incidentally, I changed all the wires. These are proper copper wires. The ones that were in it were just horribly flimsy, copper-coated aluminium. And these ones, the reason I crimped them is because I think they're just pure aluminium, uh, which means that the Reliability of the crimp connection isn't going to be guaranteed with a copper, with a, should I say, an aluminium to whatever it is, uh, connection. Anyway, let's cut to the chase with the circuitry. I shall zoom down on this and focus. So what we have is the incoming supply has a capacitive dropper here. It's then got a, this is the weakest component, I think, the whole thing. It's got a tiny little 8th watt, 510k resistor across that. That gets quite hot, and it's the one that, when it fails, will blow everything up, because it is in parallel with this capacitor, which is 330 nano. Then there's a bridge rectifier made of discrete diodes, but there's also a little bypass resistor here, and a little filter network here to give this microcontroller a... Uh, Basically a phase angle control, a zero crossing point detection signal with a very slight delay and a bit of filtering, one nanofarad capacitor. That is also the bit that, because this capacitor here is part of the power supply, it, reserve, it holds a charge for a while. If you turn the power off and on again, um, it, it loses that signal, the little phase angle control signal, and if it loses it for X amount of time, just a few cycles probably, it knows that uh, when the, it starts again that somebody turned it off and on that's to go into the next mode. 
Um, the power supply is based on a Zener diode, uh, a capacitor, a big dropper resistor here, which doesn't get too hot, despite the fact it's uh, 12K and it is basically across the mains, effectively. Uh, this is probably going to be a 5-volt diode. 5V1? I'm, see I'm seeing a V there, and uh, I didn't actually look at the circuit board for that. I should have actually taken a closer look. It might actually be visible what it says on it. 5V1. It is 5.1 volt Zener diode. That's a logical choice. That's what I used to use in one of my own controllers. And then after that, we've got a fairly complex arrangement, which is ultimately it's a transistor H bridge, but it's been quite cleverly implemented. And there's a little odd diode that just lifts the threshold of the transistors a little bit. Uh, so that is the top of the circuit board if you want to play along. And this is the bottom of the circuit board if you want to have a go at reverse engineering it yourself. But let's go straight to the schematic. And here is the schematic. It's fairly logical. I shall zoom down a little bit more. Here is the incoming capacitive dropper. I shall add a couple of dots there. And it gets rectified, but a tap is taken off with this 510k resistor going down to a divider, 100k and a 1 nano, and that will actually be clamped by the microcontroller via its little input protection diode. It's a fairly common way of getting zero crossing point detection. I used to use that as well. Uh, here's a power supply, that big beefy 12k resistor going down to the smoothing capacitor, a Zener diode, I can actually say 5.1 volt now. And it also has a 510k resistor across it to make sure that when the power is turned off, it resets the processor decisively by taking the voltage all the way down to zero quite quickly because uh, otherwise uh, sometimes they can kind of lock up a bit because they don't fully reset when they're turned off because the voltage uh, holds them in a sort of semi-reset state. Then I've only drawn half of the H bridge here because that's all we really need to see how it works. There are two outputs to the microcontroller. I mean, it's only using five pins of it. And the output has a 10K pull-down resistor for stability. Then it's got a 5.6K resistor to a MPSA42 high-voltage NPN transistor, 300 volts. But keep in mind that peak voltage here is 350, and the LEDs are not dropping that. That's being stressed with the small number of LEDs I had in it. With more LEDs, it would be less stress. Notice this diode here. It's common to both the NPN transistors, the one in this channel and the one in that channel. And uh, it just lifts the emitter voltage a little bit to make sure that the if the microcontroller can't effectively pull it right down to the zero volt rail, it makes sure that there's no risk it's going to leave it sort of slightly on when it's supposed to be off. So this, uh, when it wants to turn on, say, channel A negative, then it turns on this transistor. And that transistor does indeed turn on the A. It pulls it down to the negative rail via that diode. Uh, via a 470 ohm resistor, I think that's just generic sort of current limiting to avoid peaks and spikes. But also, as well as the LEDs, it pulls the base of the opposite channels. PNP transistor, now a PNP switches up to the positive rail. It's an MPSA92. It's a sort of partner to this one, 300 volt again. But whereas with an NPN transistor, you take the base positive to actually turn it on, with, an N, with a PNP, you take it negative. So when this one turns on, as well as turn the LEDs on via this resistor, it also turns the opposite channel's transistor on, and that takes the other leg up to the positive. So now this is negative, and this is positive. When this is turned off, when it's taken to zero volts, or a logic zero, and this uh, resistor just basically pulls it down, to, uh, that might be for startup stability. But um, then it switches to that channel. When that goes high and the other half of the bridge uh, comes on, that will effectively make this one positive and that one negative because the, it's got the matching uh, circuitry for the other half of the bridge. So it's just basically two pairs that alternate between the positive and negative rail on the opposite channels. Uh, it's very clever. It's surprisingly simplistic, but it works. The real magic, ultimately, is in the software, in that little chip. But there we have it. It's actually trashy, really cheaply made, with just in every possible way for a really crappy looking uh, but popular uh, ornamental light. Oh, incidentally, 
With just a small number of LEDs, I measured 23 milliamps, 1 watt power dissipation the whole lot, and 0.17 power factor. The power factor would improve with more LEDs, and the power would actually drop in the current. Uh, it's just because I used a small number of LEDs. If they chose, say for instance I said I want the 50 to 80 LED version, all they do is change this capacitor here, the dropper capacitor, from 330 nanofarad to a higher value, like 470 or 560 nanofarad. But that is it. It's very clever. Uh, just swapping the polarity to a very long string of LEDs that are um, dual LED chips. Uh, very neat. But there we have it. Uh, nice. It was quite a nice thing to reverse engineer, but pleasingly trashy too.